Any last words before I eat you? No, no, I, no. I I already killed you. What what are you doing here? You are dead. I I saw to it personally. What do you mean you 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 of all films got a sequel? How the hell did you, Norma the North, get a sequel? Back in 2016. Norma the North was considered one of the worst animated films of all time. Oh, how naive we were back then. It made it to many, many people's worst of lists that year, despite coming out in January. Actually, maybe because it came out in January. If you're not in the know, January is the month of the year when studios dump projects that they know are terrible, as award season is over and it's a long way before the summer blockbusters are expected to show up on the scene. On top of that, in January, no one really has cash to spend on anything because Christmas is over. Over. So, for years now, January has just been a literal dump for some of the worst films of all time. Strange Magic, for instance, was released in January. That's why, despite temporarily holding a 0% ranking on Rotten Tomatoes, Norm of the North actually got almost twice its budget back. So, maybe that's why they decided to make a sequel. When terrible animated movies that have, like, no advertising budgets break even, they tend to make a sequel to try and get as much cash as possible. The Norm of the North sequel was originally going to be straight to video, where you'd expect a morbid curiosity to be. But no, someone, somewhere, decided that this movie absolutely needed to be brought to the cinemas. Once again, in January. I, I have no idea what that says about this movie, but its theatrical run was literally for one month. To theaters January 11th, to DVD on February 12th. Well, now that Norm of the North 2 is here, uh, we may as well look into it, uh, and see what kind of hell we're getting into. I mean, how bad could it really be? I, it, it's no, it, it can't, it can't possibly be bad a, a, as the first one, right? Why did I ask that? Why did I ask that? Why did I ask that? It, it, it's gonna be the worst thing ever, isn't it? All right, all, all the chips are on the table. Hit me with everything you got, Norma the North 2. I, I, I'm just warning you though. I've got my heat ray on standby. This time, I'm not just aiming for the lemmings. I'm gonna get rid of the whole Arctic. Uh, speaking of which, that's where the movie begins. With Norm on Mount Snowmore, I guess, posing to be sculpted into a glacier. And as we can see, Norm is having some hesitations over becoming king of the Arctic. The crown doesn't fit. Maybe I should quit. Or you know how you almost single-handedly caused the problem in the first movie? Uh, that, that's a good reason for you not to be king. And then slapstick! We cut to Norm's kids, and I, and I just want you to listen to the dialogue in this movie. Listen up, guys. You know, I'm Quinn. This is my bro, Chase, and my kid sister, Maria. Our dad is gonna be named king today, which makes me a prince. But most importantly, it means you guys need to treat King Norm with some respect. I haven't heard dialogue this fascinatingly bad since, geez, Fleabag Monkey Face. Uh, where do I even begin? First of all, the character is literally introducing himself to the audience. This is a movie, not first grade. This is beyond lazy. This is literally the laziest way that you can introduce a character. It's like in a story describing a character's appearance by having them look into a mirror. It is level one. This is what you do before you even start learning what to do. It's not even first draft lazy. It sounds like they got the outline for the movie confused for the script. Secondly, because you, you are the prince, that means that they need to treat Norm, the king, with respect. I don't see your logic. The writing is going to be on this level for the entire movie, by the way. Speaking of things that are going to be on this level for the entire movie, we should talk about the animation. I'm going to be talking about it a lot, so we may as well get started. This was meant to be a straight-to-DVD movie, and it feels like it. The most noticeable thing right off the bat is that the three polar bear cubs all look way too similar. Quinn kind of looks like a miniature norm. Like, they shrunk his model or something. And the other two have different eye colors. And that's just about the only thing that differentiates them. I'm not gonna bother learning their names or any other way to differentiate them. Not because I don't care. Although, I don't care, don't get me wrong. But because there's a 50-50 shot that I'll get it wrong every single time. I've seen, like, literal identical twins in animation that were more visually distinct. And then slapstick happens! This movie has a similar problem to the first one in the fact that, like, nothing happens 
Throughout the first third of the movie, they just keep going on and on about how Norm is probably going to be a shit king. And he's probably going to be a shit king. These caribou try talking about how they think Norm is going to suck, but by this point in the movie, they've hammered that point in so much already that I completely ignore them and instead focus on things that probably don't matter in the long run. Like the fact that they each have four cards in their hands while they're playing poker, instead of five cards, which you need to play poker. Ladies, gentlemen, and caribou. Is there a reason that you need to make that distinction for caribou? In your society, are caribou like Subhuman? Uh, it sounds like this monarchy is kind of racist. I I'm sorry that I keep bringing up stupid moments of dialogue, uh, but there's just so many. I mean, I'm not gonna bring up every single instance of this because I talk about literally the entire script, uh, but it gets kind of distracting and kind of problematic. For the first time, we officially recognize the ascendancy of a new king of the Arctic. Yes, this is the very first time in the whole history of your lineage that you've ever had any kind of coronation ever. Wait, what happened to that my father's father bullshit from the first movie? Wasn't that going to be officially recognized? Wasn't Norm going to be coronated in that film? Every line of dialogue in this movie just adds questions on top of questions. And the main one, it's not even, can the people behind this film write? The main question in my mind is, do these people comprehend basic logic? Then again, this is a sequel to a film where the villain wanted to make vacation homes in the Arctic for reasons I cannot begin to comprehend, and Norm thought that he could stop it by being his spokesman and making it seem like a good idea. Norm's phone ends up ringing. It's Olympia on the other line. She calls to tell Norm that the mayor wants to present him with a key to the city. Why the mayor couldn't talk to Norm directly, I do not know. But this means that the rest of Norm in the North, too, is going to be about a polar bear in New York City. Meanwhile, at Splash Entertainment Studios... Um, sir, wasn't the first movie about a polar bear in New York City? Yeah, yeah, it was. Uh, but doesn't that mean we'll be doing the same thing over again? I know, it's brilliant. Do you really think that we have the money to make new assets or the time or inclination to be creative? Eh, you got a point. Uh, how, how, how long do you think it's gonna take to, uh, finish this one? Uh, well, our lunch break is over, so I guess we're done. You know how sometimes a bad sequel will realize that they can't really figure out what to do with all the characters that were in the original film, but they think that they need to have all of the characters that were there, and so they kind of have that character just stand around and do nothing? Well, yeah, if Olympia was pointless in the first movie, Vera is so pointless in this film, she removes the point from other characters. There is literally no reason for her to be in this movie. She does literally nothing, and Olympia herself isn't very far behind. My first order of business as your king is to go back to New York City. My first order of business as the person in charge of my country is to leave my country completely to fend for itself while I go somewhere else for some vanity project. Norm of the North, perfect king. He's gonna do absolutely fine. You can prove to the humans and the animals that you are a great and true king. Or that, I guess. Norm invites Quinn, his son, along. And thank you, God, Norm determines that the Lemmings can't come on this adventure. It seems like the people behind this movie have done us all the courtesy of figuring out that these Minions rejects are one of the worst ideas that anyone had in absolute history and should be absolutely forgotten about in- What the- Oh, you guys! I said you can't come! No, you don't care. You just want a free ride to New York. You want to pee in the subway like everyone else. Really? You came to support me? Of course, Dad. They love you. God, why have you forsaken me? So, Norm and his son and the goddamn lemmings make their way to New York City, where they meet Vera and Olympia, where this happens. Quinn speaks human too? He does. I do? Yes, you do. He does? Oh, yeah, he does. Is this supposed to be a joke? Is it legitimately trying to hand wave something? Like, I, I literally do not know what it's trying to be. What are we going for here? You know what I just noticed? We're 10 minutes into a Norm of the North movie. And you know what there's been a suspicious lack of? Oh yeah, that right there, that hits the spot. For a second there, I thought this movie wasn't trying to make my DVD player explode. You just need to be yourself. 
You're a great king because you're not totally perfect. You know, Vlad the Impaler? He wasn't totally perfect either. In fact, I'm pretty sure he was himself quite most of the time. Perfect criteria to be a great king. Then we learn that Norm has left his phone up north. Dad'll kill us if he finds out we were playing with his phone. Oh, relax! I just want to see if we can live stream Dad's key ceremony. I'm nervous he's gonna mess it up. Well, let's try to track him. No, let me see. We can try and triangulate his coordinates by using a combination of a peer-to-peer -peer traffic system and the city of New York's own proprietary mapping algorithms. You know that these cubs, like, live in the Arctic, right? In a, in a polar bear civilization? A place that doesn't have technology? I know that kid geniuses and such are a common trope in media, especially in animation, and I usually don't have a problem with it. I mean, I don't have a problem with the idea of Olympia being a genius, but when they grow up in the middle of nowhere and are animals, it kind of pushes the suspension of disbelief. How can a character be a computer genius when they ha they do not live in an area that has computers? We're introduced to the mayor of New York City. In the first movie, the villain Mr. Green was very weirdly animated. He was over the top and had these extreme movements that didn't really fit in with the movie, compared to everyone else's more realistic, stilted animation. I don't know if they listen to criticism or whatever, because that doesn't happen with this guy. Actually, it's kind of the opposite problem. The mayor's animation is so stilted. I'm not entirely sure, but it feels like there are frames missing from it. The happy mask salesman from Majora's Mask goes from pose to pose and changes expressions more smoothly. The worst animation, though, in this movie is the cologne. Instead of animating gas into a 3D environment, it's clear they just took the film and then scribbled some green onto it. Also, in the meantime, we get interjections from Norm's family and friends back at the Arctic. This serves literally no purpose. Oh wait, yes it does. There, There is one purpose that this does serve. It raises the temptation for me to push the button on my heat ray. Oops. Oops. My finger slipped. Well, I guess we should look on the bright side. In about two weeks, we won't have to worry about the melting Arctic ice caps. Because there will be no Arctic ice caps. When Norm is invited to talk in front of the whole city, Quinn meets Mrs. Lieberman. This character is the most pointless thing in existence. She has two lines, that is it, and she's kind of meant to be a sympathy romp. And then slapstick! So the mayor gives Norm the key to the city, something that unlocks every single door within it. Wow, I, I haven't heard that one in 20 odd some years. The key to the city cliche I thought was pretty much dead because it's absolutely stupid if you look at it in any way whatsoever. There's a reason that no cartoon ever uses this anymore, even in a parody. What point is there to giving one person a key that opens every single door in the city? What point is there in making a key to open every single door in a city? Considering that locks come in all shapes and sizes, and the key that Norm gets is far too large to fit into most buildings, how the hell do you make a key that opens every single lock? Unless it's like, magic. Imagine everyone naked! Wait a minute. I'm the only one who's naked. <laughs> no. I didn't need to hear that. I didn't need to hear that at all. But I did. Nor in the North too. It's it's a movie that is just so willing to give to its audience. Then Norm ends up giving a great speech. Kinda. You know, it's like when a show or a movie has someone throw a rock at another character's head, uh, killing them, and then the, this character buries them in the backyard, and, and then this character is called a good neighbor. Then we have a crowd shot that's missing the crowd. Key in right hand, key in left hand. This is the part of the movie where the bad animation becomes really apparent. It's not so noticeable in the Arctic, but in the city of New York, it starts to get very, very distracting. Let's start with the fact that 8 million people live in New York City, and on Norm's way home, he runs into a grand total of about three of them. In the middle of the day, in front of an empty street. You can make a movie about an apocalypse wiping out all of humanity, and New York City would be more populated than it is in this movie. I am being absolutely 100% serious when I say this. The streets of New York City being this barren is more unbelievable than a bear that can talk to humans. Also, every single car is a taxi. Every single one. They meet the Norm impersonator in another scene, and the scene goes nowhere and does nothing. I just wanted to say I saw your speech, buddy. I'm pretty impressed with the king you've become. Hmm, I think I understand my problem with this movie. From my perspective, Norm has done nothing. Like, absolute jack. However, if we rewatch the first movie, and we really take it in, Norm caused the problem of that film, and literally every action he did made things worse. 
Doing nothing is actually an improvement. Uh, the problem is that a character, especially a king, shouldn't get accolades for reaching basic standards. What's next? Praising him because he washes his hands? <clears throat> what? You gonna wash your hands? No. Cause I'm evil. Also, this movie is a Scooby-Doo type mystery. I'm not joking! The next morning, Norm is woken up. Someone impersonated him, stole the keys to the city, and then started robbing banks. And it's the mayor. There is literally no one else it could be, but the mayor. I'm not exaggerating, it really is a complete Scooby-Doo level farce. They set up a red herring with the Norm impersonator just to mislead the audience. The only thing that works in this mystery's favor of it being hard to solve is that, as we've established, the people who made this movie can't logic very well. Norm had the keys to the city, the thing that unlocks every door in the city. He was sleeping in an apartment with four other people. I presume that the door to said apartment was locked. So, how did anyone get in? Hey, Mom! How can I stay calm? I've lost my entire life saving! I lose my house! Okay, that's not how banks work. In the United States, any money that you've saved in a bank is insured up to $250,000. Specifically, in case the bank collapses or, you know, gets robbed. This doesn't make sense! Why would anyone think I did this? Uh, do you want the full list, or w would you like some highlights? So Olympia and Quinn decide to go on the investigation. Also, a young child has access to bank security camera footage. Alright, 5950. Chronologically, 10 seconds before Norm robbed the bank. 4528. Literally four and a half minutes earlier on the same staircase. Animation errors can be common, but usually they're a little bit more well-hidden. And they're especially bad in this movie. It's like the world's worst game of I Spy. You look around, you will find something. And I'm not showing you all of them. I'm just showing you the ones that I noticed on first watch through. They play the security camera footage for it again, and it's back to 59 minutes. Did anybody watch this movie before they decided to send it to theaters? Because I will remind you, they sent this movie to theaters. They follow some leads that don't go anywhere, but Olympia tries to investigate. And by try, I mean she really, really tries. Give her some credit. Not so fast. Look at this. 11 p.m., Lex Bank was robbed. 2 a.m., Soho Bank. And then an hour later, the Christopher Street Bank. Except that the security cameras that were shown on the news say that one of the banks was robbed at midnight exactly. And at nearly 1 a.m., the Norm impersonator was seen making a getaway. Uh, but that's only a small nitpick next to Olympia's other bit of crime solving. The fourth biggest bank in New York City is the Bank of Chinatown, and they deduce that it's the next place that's going to be robbed. Okay, that's a bit of a leap of logic. If this guy's motivation was just to demonize Norm, why would this person risk robbing another bank? After he robbed three banks in one night, couldn't he just get away scot-free while Norm takes the blunt of it? How do you know that this person is going to rob again? But beyond that, assuming that they are going to rob more banks, what makes you think that they're gonna stop at four? I literally do not see the pieces of logic here. They're literally just making things up and not connecting them together. Olympia says that the ocean is only a few blocks away and that's how she knows that there's going to be a getaway. But what makes you think that the ocean is their escape plan? I mean, wouldn't the police be on high alert and guarding this next bank? If they were, the ocean may as well be as far away as, I don't know, the Arctic. Olympia is one of the stupidest child characters in history. Not just stupidest child genius characters, stupidest child characters. And yes, they're trying to portray her as a child genius. But uh, Ralph Wiggum would have a better chance of solving this mystery than Olympia. Miss Hoover? Yes, Ralph. I don't have a red crayon. Why not? I ate it. Oh. It's my mom. Hey, Mom, don't worry about me. I'm just going to try and stop a bank robbery against people who might very well be armed. I'll be home by bedtime. Toodles. So Vera and Norm come to help with Norm in disguise. Yeah, let's go. Good idea. First, I gotta get out of this. A little itchy. He says as he scratches the only part of his body not covered in disguise. Like, did they give instructions to the animators in a language that they did not understand? The Norm impersonator gets beat up and then runs out of the bank. Past the suspicious lack of no police. In front of a bank. The biggest bank that is yet to be robbed. When a serial bank robber is at large. I don't demand that stories and animation be one-to-one -one with reality, but I would like just the barest blip of believability so that I know that the people behind this 
care about anything at all. The impersonator was stopped by a kung fu rabbit, who has very interesting direction when it comes to voice acting. It's like they wanted someone with a Chinese accent, but wasn't trying at all to give a Chinese accent. I, I don't even know how the hell to describe this. <laughs> More robbers, huh? Hmm. <laughs> it's all in the lucky foot. Easy! Robber suits have a zipper. Real bears don't have zippers. So yeah, there's just this giant talking kung fu rabbit now. He can also speak the universal human language. I would say that it destroys the logic and integrity of this movie's universe, but as has been well established by now, this film series has none of that. Still, if this movie could jump the shark, this would probably be that moment. Then we cut to one of the worst chase scenes that I have seen in quite some time, and that is solely due to the laziness in the animation. There are three vehicle models, a red car, a taxi, and a bus. You see these over and over and over again. If you count all of them up, you go insane. This scene goes on for minutes and it's just incredibly noticeable. Like this is the most blatantly lazy scene that I've seen in animation in probably the whole history of doing this show. They don't even try to make the car that Norm's chasing a different color. How hard is it to change the model to blue or something? This fake Norm robbing banks is a coward. And to find him, we need to find the money! Shouldn't be too hard. Banks mark notes specifically to track down robbers, and why am I why am I even trying to think that they know anything about anything anymore? So, Norm gets thrown into an almost empty cell because making assets is for Pixar. Just when you believe that Alita has humanity and goodness, he goes and does something like this. You're telling me I had my life savings in that bank. I don't know how I'll afford college for my kids now. If you're going to have a running joke like that, it's probably wise to make sure that it logically makes sense. If you store money in a bank, it is insured by the government. So Fung breaks into Norm's prison cell. I have a very important message from your son, Quinn. <clears throat> Strawberry on pretzel bread, no pickles, extra cheese, fries, diet cola. Oh, wait, that was my receipt from lunch. Sorry. <laughs> wow. Like, this is an animation error that I, I have to point out. So, first of all, this is a common joke that you see in a lot of movies. Like, this happened in SpongeBob, you know, two decades ago. Okay, so here's the animation error for those who didn't see how blatantly bad this is. Fung starts by reading a receipt to his lunch. But as he's doing that, he's actually reading the note. Then he says that he's accidentally reading his receipt. He flips it over to the side with the receipt and then he starts reading the note from Quinn. It's not like you can ignore it either. They draw specific attention to this, and it's on screen for a prolonged period of time. Like, how, how do you let that slide? Attention all police officers. There are free donuts in the lobby. I repeat, there are free donuts in the lobby. That is all. <laughs> wow, that sounds just plausible enough to completely abandon my job. All right, on to the half-assed climax. So the barge starts to get away, so Norm and Flung go flying in a helicopter. You guys look familiar. That's because they're the exact same henchmen from the first movie. And you know what else looks familiar? The ship and the barge that you're currently on. And you know what else looks familiar? Every single model in the entire movie. If you are blatantly recycling things like this movie does, perhaps it's best not to draw attention to it. But no, what I'm doing is wrong. I know it's wrong, but I'm gonna do it anyway. So this fight scene is absolutely amazing for the worst possible reasons. Both the henchmen have Norm in their sights. There's no reason that they think that anyone else is with him. They're approaching him with shock sticks and they have him outnumbered. He is right in their sights. Then someone somewhere else whistles, and one of them, without dealing with Norm at all, just walks off. And then they all get beaten up. We retrieved all the money. It's here. But we still don't know who calls the shots for the henchmen. Who really stole the money? How do you know that none of the henchmen stole the money? Why can't one of them be in charge of the operation? You know what, I, I think that I have to make an apology. When I call this movie a Scooby-Doo style mystery, I had no idea how insulting it would have been to Scooby-Doo. Scooby-Doo's mysteries may be bland, repetitive, and easy to solve, but let's give them credit. When they say that clue means something, generally speaking, that clue means what they say, logically in their own universe. <sighs> let's return the money to the mayor. He'll know I'm innocent. He'll help us. <laughs> really 
this movie can eat a dick. And then slapstick! G guess how they find out that the mayor is the villain. No, no guess, because because you'll never guess this. The bag of money smells like the mayor's cologne. Okay, where do I begin describing everything wrong with this? First of all, when Norm was hit with a bag of money from earlier, the very same bag of money, there was no aroma, and it didn't cause Norm to sneeze. The money on the boat didn't cause Norm to sneeze. Secondly, the mayor was in a bear suit that had been put through the dry cleaners. I don't think that any kind of cologne smell would escape from the bear suit. Third, why would the mayor put on cologne before robbing a bank? Why would he be concerned about anyone smelling him there and then? Are bank robber mayors just known for trying to be as presentable as possible? And fourthly, and this is probably the most important, how do you know it was him through his cologne alone? It's not a brand he made or himself, it's probably a commercial brand. They didn't even make a joke like, he's the only one in the city willing to wear this brand. No, anyone else could have put on the cologne. Hell, at this point, it's possible that someone is also trying to frame the mayor. After all, isn't this criminal prone to impersonating government officials? Norm then opens up the mayor's secret compartment, and... I just realized, this is Mr. Green's office. Y you know, the villain from the first movie. Yeah, this is just his office with some of the assets removed. And the secret layer places are replaced with the closet. Ha! <laughs> I'm the mayor! I'm as powerful as a king! Wrong. That is absolutely wrong. I mean, yeah, this guy sounds awful, but in my opinion, it's probably a step up from the guy who decided to tax soft drinks. I can do what I want! That's not what being a king is. Being a king is the responsibility of knowing what's right and what's wrong. And to know that if you do something wrong, you apologize for it. Well, uh, when a king does something wrong, people tend to die. At that point, an apology probably isn't enough. So, we got a helicopter chase. Vaughn, get as close as he can! Norm, what are you going to do? No, he, he's not. He can't be doing what I think he's about to do. He, he does. Norm, Norm jumps from a helicopter that's directly above the helicopter that he's trying to jump to. From that angle, Norm would have been cut to ribbons by the helicopter's propeller, and it would be raining bear chunks all across New York City. Or, assuming that the propeller doesn't cut him to ribbons, uh, he'd probably be beaten to death and lacerated. And they'd both go down in a fiery explosion. You know what? I prefer that ending. Let's assume that that happens. Good night, everybody. Norm of the North 2 is an awful film, in every sense of the word. I mean, what would you expect from a film that was meant to be a straight-to-DVD sequel of a film that was made on a shoestring budget? Everything is a downgrade from the first film. The animation is so much lazier. Scenes are barren and empty. There are more continuity errors than cars in this film. Very few characters do anything of substance. But, I, I mean, what do you expect? The first movie was cheaper and lazier than Disney's straight-to-DVD videos that they don't care about. The only thing this movie keeps from the original is its sense of logic. In the first film, Norm tried to stop Mr. Green from building homes in the Arctic by going to New York City and becoming the spokesperson for homes in the Arctic. In this movie, they figure out that the mayor is the bad guy who somehow knew where to find a perfectly accurate Norm look-like suit and break into a house to steal a key that unlocks every door in New York City. Uh, they figure out that this was the guy who was the bad guy because he wore cologne and apparently sprayed the bag of money with said cologne. In the grand scheme of things, it's hard to know which one of these two movies is worse. This one is far more cheaply made, and there's less effort put into everything. But I must say, there's a lot less effort being put into being outwardly obnoxious. This time, any sense of being obnoxious is far less intentional. There's very little twerking, for instance. However, there is one thing that probably tips the scale in this movie's favor. It's just a teensy tiny thing, and I don't know if it's reasonable enough to call this movie worse than the uh, uh, first one. It, like I said, it, it's a very, very small thing, uh, but it's the fact that we're only halfway through this movie. I didn't laugh. I'm not kidding. This has been the first 45 minutes of a 91 minute film. We've still got half the movie to go. Join me in part two. Sorry, Ruben.